Good morning and welcome everyone. This is the spring symposium of the Alabama Advanced Partnership for Achieving Gender Equity in STEM. The partnership includes the University of Alabama at Birmingham, Alabama a and University, Miles College, Oakwood University, and the University of Alabama in Huntsville and Auburn University as well. We thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to begin by thanking all of our co-PIs at our partner institutions for the ongoing efforts that they have provided to support the success of our advanced initiative. This semester, UAB, along with our UAB partners, have hosted a series of workshops, all virtual, of course. And the final workshop is scheduled for April 22nd that will uh, focus on search committee training featuring Dr. Michelle Allen and Dr. Antonia Adebech at Miles College. The University of Alabama will also host an individual screening of picture of scientists during Women's History Month. The film chronicles the groundswell of researchers who are writing a new chapter for women scientists. The screening sponsored by the U U UAB Commission on the Status of Women, the Office of the Vice President for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion and Alabama Advance will take place on March 8th, 9th and 10th. For information about ways to access the screening, please visit our website at uab.edu backslash DEI. That screening will also be followed by a virtual panel discussion that will include our very own Dr. Farah Lubin, Associate Professor in the School of Medicine, Dr. Naisia Scott, who is a postdoc student in the microbiology department, Dr. Lori McMahon, who is Dean of the UAB Graduate School and a neuroscientist herself, Dr. Alicia Schriebert, Professor and Senior Associate Dean for Graduate and Postdoctoral Affairs, and Adriana Starks, who will be the moderator. She is the CEO of Stream Innovations and founder of that program. We invite you to join us for this uh, screening. It's a pro project that you certainly will not be missed, want to miss. It's very provocative. And now to introduce our speaker. Today, I'm honored to introduce our speaker, who is Dr. Freeman Habrowski, president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. When I thought about a way to introduce Habrowski that would take us beyond all of the um, accolades uh, and the many honors that he has received, I thought of um, a parable. It's a legend tale, a legend tale of a French monastery known throughout Europe for the extraordinary leadership of a man known only as Brother Leo. Several monks began pilgrimage to visit Brother Leo to learn from him. Almost immediately, they began to bicker about who should, be, who should do the various chores. On the third day, they met another monk going to the monastery and he joined them. This monk never complained or shirked a duty. And whenever the others would fight over a chore, he would gracefully volunteer to do it. By the last day, the others were following his example and from then on, the work together, they worked together smoothly. When they reached the monastery and asked to see Brother Leo, the men who gathered greeted them and laughed. But our brother is among you. And he pointed to the fellow who had joined them. Today, many people seek leadership positions, not so much for what they can do for others, but what the position can do for them. Status, connections, perks, advantages. They do service as an investment, a way to build an impressive resume. The parable about Brother Leo teaches another model of leadership, where leaders are preoccupied with serving rather than being followed, with giving rather than getting, with doing alongside others rather than demanding. Leadership based on authenticity, emotional intelligence, and inclusiveness, not position-based power. A native son of Birmingham, our speaker is our brother Leo, and we are so glad that he sits among us today. Dr. Hrabowski has served as president of UB, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County since 1992, and he's a consultant on science and math education to national agencies, universities, and school systems. He was named president by President Obama to chair the President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans. He also chaired the National Academies Committee that produced the report Expanding Underrepresented Minority Crossroads in 2011. His 2013 TED Talk highlights the four pillars of college success in science. Hrabowski holds an astounding number of achievements. 
In 2009, he was named the, one of Time's 10 best college presidents. In 2011, the Washington Post named him one of seven top American leaders. In 2012, he received the Heinz Award for contributions to improving the human condition and was placed on Time's 100 most influential people list. And President Obama appointed him chair of the Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans. More recently, he received the American Council on Education's Lifetime Achievement Award and was named the recipient of the University of California Berkeley's Clark Kerr Award in 2019. His recent book, The Empowered University, written with two NBC colleagues, examines how university communities support academic success by cultivating and empowering institutional culture. Despite these accomplishments, I am, he says, I am most proud of his humility. He continued with efforts for he is always reminding us that success is never final. Welcome Dr. Habrowski, or should I say Brother Habrowski. <laughs> I love that introduction and your kindness. Thank you for your kindness, Dr. Dilworth. I'm delighted to be here uh, to all of you. I always begin with poetry. My mother who taught there in the Birmingham City Schools for so many years, um, focused on literature. And I begin with poetry that I often use from our beloved and now late Maya Angelou, who said, lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it, this dream, into the palms of your hands. Mold it into the image of your most public self. Sculpt it into the shape of your most private need. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face and say simply, very simply with hope, good morning. Good morning to Alabama. Good morning to all the universities. I am a product of the Birmingham City Schools. I am the son of people who were educated my mother and father in Alabama, in Wetumpka, and in Selma, and graduates, they were graduates of your HBCUs there, Alabama A&M, and State, and Tuskegee. Uh, and I, most important though, I, I thank my teachers in the Birmingham City Schools for giving me, and working with my parents to give me a sense of self, of the importance of reaching out and making a difference. My message today is a simple one. It is that the way we think about ourselves, the language that we use, the way we interact with each other, the values that we hold will be so important. We become like the things that we love, whether we're talking about our society or a university or a state. Uh, and for you, as you think about the NSF program advance and about issues of race and gender in our society and in institutions, it is important to think about the language we use and to have some historical context. I, I'm a Southerner. I am in Baltimore now, we are the Upper South, but I like saying Birmingham is a really the Deep South and I'm very proud to be from the Deep South. And we Southerners love stories. And I often tell the story about growing up there and going to my church, Sixth Avenue Baptist Church and having to go even in the middle of the week and during the civil rights movement in the sixties and this special minister was coming to speak and my parents were determined that I would go. And so I'm sitting in the back, not wanting to be there where kid wants to be in church in the middle of the week. And they placate me with the two things I love most, math. I've always gotten goosebumps doing math. And my, uh, so I was doing my word problems and, and eating, eating. I was getting fatter cheeks all the time. I was eating M&Ms, the good kind with the peanuts. And it's a funny story and yet it's a serious story in that all of a sudden, the gentleman at the podium, at the lectern, said, if the children participate in this peaceful protest, all of America will understand that even our young people know the difference between right and wrong and will want a better education. We we're very proud of our Black teachers. They were working so hard. But it was clear everyone knew we were not getting the same level of resources as, as the white children. We knew that. Uh, and wanted to understand what that would mean to get the same level of resources. Now, as we all have come to know, the South doesn't put as much money into education anyway. So we have a challenge there. But what that message did for me was to inspire me to march in the Children's March, in the Children's Crusade. And I hope you now have that in the history books of Alabama because it's such a powerful story 
uh, in the words of Thoreau, uh, uh, when we think about civil disobedience and what we can do as American citizens. And I did go to jail as a result. It was a horrible experience to be put in jail because we wanted the better education. And yet at the same time, it was an empowering experience because in the middle of the week, Dr. King came and stood outside and all of the children are looking there and the little kids are crying. And he said, what you children do this day will have an impact on generations not yet born. And it did have that kind of impact. And all the things that you know about in our state, the four little girls, my friends over at 16th Street Baptist, all the way to the assassination of, of, of a president, of our beloved John Kennedy, and to the, the next year when a Southerner did make a difference. Lyndon Johnson did make a big difference. That Texas, what Texan was able to get that civil rights bill passed and then the voting rights bill and the higher education bill. Why is all that important? It's important because our landscape as a country changed when thinking about who should go to college. We start there, well, who should go to college? The fact is that in the 40s with the GI Bill, as much as we appreciate the GI Bill now, the people who fought the GI Bill when, when FDR proposed it in the mid 40s were college presidents from the president of Harvard to the president of the University of Chicago. They thought that people who were not from privilege should get a trade and that college was, would, would be for people of great privilege. And so for the first time, what happened was veterans did come in to colleges and within a matter of several years, two million were there. Now they were still mainly white men, but there were some blacks and some women. And America began to see that maybe college was for regular people. And so when the Higher Education Act passed in 65, people got on board. And at that point, um, believe it or not, only 10% of Americans had had someone graduate from college. 11% of whites, three to 4% of blacks. The Higher Education Act and then the Pell Grant Act a few years later, and all of a sudden we were off and running. But in the 60s, when I was still a student at Ullman High School, which is on your campus at UAB, the fact is that 90% of Americans of all race never thought their kids would go to college. And then all of a sudden we started seeing more people go to college. And now we're up to about 30% for the country. We're at 37% of whites, about 25% of blacks, only about 11, 14%, 14 to 15% of Hispanics. The Asian population is about 50%. But put it together, two thirds of Americans have never had anyone graduate from college. The Southern states have fewer people. You know that Alabama is closer to 25, 26%. And the challenges with people of color, blacks and others, we know about those too. But the fact is that there is this mindset that more people should be going to college, either for a two-year degree or a four-year degree and more. And so you've got that context as we think about race and gender in the academy. The good news is that we've had increases in those levels. The challenging news is that we have a lot of work to do, whether talking about at the faculty level or at the student level, in terms of the number of women, the numbers of Blacks and Latinos and others of color, the numbers of first generation college are still uh, small compared to where they need to be. I could give you all the data and I'm going to uh, suggest that you look at my new book that my colleagues and I wrote, The Empowered University, because we give a lot of that data. And the, the subtitle of the book is, is Culture Change, Shared Leadership, Culture Change and Academic Success. I am very proud that several of the people there at UAB are close to me personally. Two of my former students, um, uh, there, Dr. Stephanie Borkin Wallace and Dr. Nefertiti Harmon Durant are African American women who were in our Maha program that I'm going to talk about today, uh, majoring in the life siences and went on to Hopkins and, and one case and to Yale, the other case for med school, and then on to get additional training at Harvard and Duke. And now they're there, faculty doing really well at UAB. I'm very proud of them. And then finally, um, one of my mentees. It sounds strange to say that a big dean and executive vice president, but Selwyn Vickers is also a mentee who left the state of Alabama when I left working at Alabama a and for a year to move to be in Baltimore at another college. He was becoming a freshman at Hopkins. And so I am connected to UAB. I received an honorary degree from there some years ago and connected to some of the other institutions. This is what I want you to think about. The question is, what can we do to increase the number of people who are doing well enough at the undergraduate level, people of color and women 
that we will then see more thinking about going into the professoriate and we can talk about the increasing the number of women in certain disciplines and the number of people of color. There is that need for intersectionality. I'm very proud to have been the, the PI on our advance grant with a number of co-PIs who were women colleagues who were chairs of departments. And our program did substantially increase the number of women as percent of the total tenure track and tenured faculty. We still have a long way to go. We we're up to close to 30%. We were at 12%. Uh, and you are all in that same range for so many of the institutions. I do know that it's a partnership. You've got different institutions there. Uh, and what I would say to you, the HBCUs and Auburn and UAB, uh, and what I would say is that every institution has to disaggregate data, as you know, to look by department and by gender and by race to understand the challenges you face in particular areas. Across the board, I will tell you that women are much less represented, very underrepresented in the technical areas, in computer science and engineering. We know that. We do better in the life sciences when looking at the number of doctorates, but we still have the problem that we see more movement upward by men, white men, than other groups. You have, in some cases, made progress in increasing the number of assistant professors and you're moving towards associate, but I think it's without a doubt, all of us can do much better with regard to race and gender in these areas. What I want you to think about will be several things. Number one, the idea of culture change. Eric Weiner, uh, A, and some would say Eric Weiner, uh, wrote the book, The Geography of Bliss. And he says, culture is the sea we swim in, so all consuming that we fail to recognize it until we step out of it and look back at it. And that's what I would challenge all of us to do. The idea of the empowered university is being empowered to look at self. That means look in the mirror, get out of oneself, look back at oneself, look, take the time to understand the strengths, what we're doing well, where we've had improvements. And then secondly, to talk about what we need to do. I think your state would say the same as mine, that we know we need to increase the number of young people of color, African-Americans, Latinx, Native Americans, and particularly when we think about our Southern states, Blacks, as well as Hispanics, who can succeed in science. Uh, you heard me saying that my background is mathematics. See, the fact is that my goal has been for years since going to my beloved Hampton and then the University of Illinois to grad school to see if I could see more people looking like me who were in front of the classroom. And that's women. And when I was at Illinois, um, I'd be the only black in the class in grad school. And quite frankly, there was only one woman faculty member out of about 100 in mathematics at Illinois. And she had a way of giving me a look that said she understood what I was going with. And while she had a PhD, she was not a tenured faculty member. And so I, I've understood for years the parallelism as we think about gender and race together. There's several things though, about, about culture that are important. It is the idea that we're talking about the questions we will ask, the level of honesty we are about our weaknesses, the, the behavior, the actions that we give credit to and that we have incentives for trying to get people to move in a certain direction, the amount of time we spend on different issues, the level of importance given to those issues. I have spoken um, uh, at every place from the Dean of Science at Harvard had me there a few weeks ago uh, and I said there, the same thing I've said at Ohio State and at Publix and whatever, that to make a difference, faculty are important. We know staff members matter, Dr. Dilworth and the others who are there doing things. I have a, little, a cousin who worked there with you all in equity, Audrey Smith. He was always proud to be part of that team to build equity and outreach in that area. And we need staff. But my TED Talk talks about the need to pull researchers into the work. In fact, what I say in that TED Talk is in four pillars of college success in science, that we need to look at high expectations. We need to look at building community. It's important to think about the role of faculty and researchers in pulling people into the work. And then we need rigorous evaluation. That when we think about equity and inclusion, it's not just about checking off the box. It's not just about something done in a kind of rote fashion. It is about deep analytical thinking to challenge ourselves to ask the question, what will it take to move the needle? As we look at what's happening in the country in the past 20 years, 
with some trends in the right direction, for the most part, we're still where we were. I chaired the Obama Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans and was fortunate to chair the National Academies Committee on underrepresentation. And, and in both cases, we looked at the data of all the national agencies. In many agencies in our country, under 1% of the scientists are Black. Even at NIH, it's under 2%, even when talking about health disparities. And similarly, the, the numbers for Hispanics, very small, three or 4%. And for women, while we're making progress, there are many areas where we still have a lot of work to do. And so what we did with our advanced program is the same thing we do as we talk about the TED Talk, as, the, as we have done with something called the Meyerhoff Scholars Program. The two young women I mentioned who are women physicians there and, and faculty members there at UAB, both were Meyerhoffs. The Meyerhoff Program started 30 plus years ago, designed to increase the number of Blacks at first, and then we said minorities. And now we've said people of all races interested in the issue of underrepresentation who become experts in science, engineering, and medicine. We have pushed PhDs because this is where we have the smallest numbers of people. We have more physicians when thinking about proportion than we have PhDs. And our number one strength is that we've become the number one producer of Blacks who go on to get MD PhDs. We produce twice as many as the second institution, Harvard, in fact. What we learned from the National Academy study is that, quite frankly, we see the first two years of science and engineering in the undergrad experience as weed out courses. And so most people who start to become doctors or scientists change their majors. And it's just accepted that way. And that's why when we look globally, what we see is that only 5% of Americans graduate with a bachelor's degree in natural sciences and engineering compared to almost 11% in Europe. And if it were not for people coming from other countries to grad school here, we would have a serious problem with the science and engineering infrastructure of our nation. I can tell you that on my campus, which is a public research campus, very similar to UAB, but without the medical school. And that's a big part of who you are. We are arts and sciences and engineering through the PhD having produced a number of graduates who are now leaders from the head of the Applied Physics Lab at Hopkins who has his PhD from us in computer science to the head of Clemson who has all three degrees uh, to a number of other people I'll talk about. But this is the point about Meyerhoff and about UMBC that you can appreciate when thinking about University of Alabama Huntsville, which is founded I think in the late 50s, University of Alabama, uh, Birmingham as a separate campus mid 60s. The fact is that our campus was founded at that time too. And one of the differences was that for the first time in our southern state of Maryland, kids of all races could come there. It has been a predominantly white campus. It is now a, the largest minority is Asian, maybe 25 percent, maybe 18 percent black and then Latino. So it's about half and half. But we are with an emphasis on having more undergraduates all, of all types go to med school, to science, engineering and med school and professional schools. Most important, though, about 40 percent of the STEM students of all races will go to grad school. Now, how is that happening? Meyerhoff has been a big part of that. What is the Meyerhoff program? It's a program designed to attract high achieving students. People say, well, the high achieving students will do okay. You need to work on the others. Well, we need to support other students, but even high achieving black kids don't go on and excel in science because high achieving white kids often don't also. Weed out courses for all. The National Academy study we chaired showed that literally only 20% of Blacks, high achieve, Blacks in general, who begin with a major in science or engineering, graduate with a bachelor's in that area. For whites, it's only 32%, and for Asians, it's only 41%. And often, the more prestigious the university, the greater the probability the student changes major from STEM after the first year or two. So it is a global problem that we're talking about for our country. It is an issue involving people of color. It is an issue involving women, especially in areas like computer science, where only about 20% of the students are of, of color, of women, excuse me, and small percentages uh, in, of, of color. Why is that important? As I think about the ecosystem of any campus, as I think about the, the diversity in, in STEM, I think about the faculty level, the undergrad level, the grad level, postdocs, and what we do with K-12, another place where there's a need. But what the study showed was that the biggest place where you can make progress would be with those undergrad students to do a much better job to get more of them thinking about graduate school and then the professoriate. Uh, and, and I will tell you for our campus, we've been making progress with that, but also with people who go into our biotech park, we've got a research park with about, uh, that has both biotech and IT, heavily cybersecurity with about 120 companies. And the good news in the spirit of advance is that 30% of our CEOs are women. 
and 25% are minorities. Uh, and that helps to create that ecosystem I'm talking about that can help the economy, that helps to make the point to younger people, I can be a CEO, I can be a professor at a university. What made the difference with Mahoff? And I, I ask you to, if you Google it, you can get all the articles we've written. Uh, and I should tell you, we have been replicating the program at other institutions, Howard Hughes, the Howard Hughes Foundation, HHMI gave us funding to replicate it at two large schools, Penn State and Chapel Hill. And right now, Chan Zuckerberg is replicating the program at Berkeley and San Diego. And the key is this, the idea, again, that goes with the TED Talk that I mentioned, it has everything to do with the students you bring in and giving them support, building community among those students, a bridge program that gets them prepared, teaches them the nobility of this work. They're doing this not just for themselves, but we, we need many more people who are in science and in medicine to help us with all the problems of humankind. But then the notion of a, a key emphasis on faculty, student interaction, as well as support from staff who can make a difference and then evaluating what we're doing and building that sense of community at every level. And so the first mile halls were M1s, for example, and that was a group of black males. Bob Milehoff, a philanthropist, gave us money to help a number of males. And I should tell, while some people didn't like the idea of a program for males, black women were the first to say how wonderful it was to have something for the group that seems to be in prison so often more so than college. And the next year we brought in women, uh, and the, the, the two faculty members were in that first three or four classes, uh, and they went on as many did. And so we are now up to M32s. Uh, and the good news is that every group is supportive of the group right behind it. And so we have large numbers in graduate school now, uh, and numbers of students now who've gone on to the faculty, women. Women, it's, the program is clearly 50 some percent women, 40 some percent male. We try to keep it as much half and half. And, and the key here is this. If we want to increase the number of women and people of color at the prof, in the professoriate, we must identify people early and give them the opportunity to think about what it would mean to go to the professor and the advantages of doing that kind of work. What has made the difference has been the use of analytics, looking at the trends, understanding in every department, in every major, in every course, with every faculty member who is succeeding and who is not, using focus groups to understand some of the challenges, looking at the relationship between academic preparation and the foundation work at the beginning, also being very aware that we need to rethink how we teach. And so the, the faculty at UMBC decided when I was celebrating my 20th anniversary as president to have a big fundraiser to raise an innovation fund. And they, they called it the Rabowski Innovation Fund. I didn't especially like the name because I think of naming things after people who've already gone ahead, who've already died, but they wanted the name. So it's the Rabowski Innovation Fund for Teaching and Learning. And it focuses on giving faculty release time to rethink the teaching of courses. And we started in the lower level science courses, but now we're doing it across disciplines. And it's money for um, not only release time, but also to develop materials of the technology. And it's been a fascinating success. Look at the, the Chemistry Discovery Center, the UMBC Chemistry Discovery Center. So CDC on our campus, <coughs> excuse me, it's not for disease, it is for chemistry discovery. Look at that as an example of how we work on group work, using technology, feedback all the time, faculty member going around the room and mixing up the group, teaching students how to work with people from different races and different groups, very important. So the idea of professional support course redesign, the notion of changing the culture, of building success, and most important, of getting us to say where we know we need to improve. High expectations of the university, of the structures there, and for the professoriate. What are the things we need to do? The replication of this program has led to great, great success. If you look at science, if you look at the MAU program in science, you'll see several articles. One is on the replication of an article written by faculty from all three campuses, Chapel Hill, Penn State, and UMBC, and the three presidents, uh, because it does require a commitment from every level. Uh, we started the replication because people said, well, the only reason it works is because you are a black president of a predominantly white university. I said, no, you can have a white faculty member. And so Carol at Chapel Hill at the time, a white, and at, at Penn State, one woman, one man, and they had the commitment. They found the resources. They did some fundraising. They wrote grants. And now they're on their way. 
and it can be done. I would challenge Alabama. When I, if you look at my articles in the last two or three years on issues in science and technology for the top 50 institutions and in producing blacks who go on to get PhDs or MD PhDs, you're gonna be hard pressed to find somebody from your state. And I say that as a fellow Alabamian that I know you, you are so special, you can be much better than that. And even if you were producing five or six, you'd get into that list of institutions. And I wanna challenge you to think about being on that list just to get it started so you can have that brand. You have been able to attract wonderful faculty of color from around the country and world. And so the brand is there that it's a good place to be. You wanna do the same thing at the student level. I want to end with a wonderful story because I wanna get into questions and answers. I wanna end with a, story, a very quick story about two of my graduates who reflect the strength of our university. One young woman is black, one is white. Each now is a leading world-class scientist. We are honored at UMBC that the woman who is right now leading the NIH study uh, on, for COVID and asymptomatic patients is Dr. Caitlin Sattler, S-A-D-T-L-E-R, Caitlin, K-A-I-T-L-Y-N, Google her. Um, she has, my TED Talk does well, it's over a million hits. She has twice as many hits of my, on hers on healing the body. And she is literally one half my age, I love it. Uh, but look her up, um, it's an amazing story. She went to UMBC, then Hopkins for the PhD and postdoc at MIT. She's leading that study for NIH right now. And the other one gives me goosebumps, a young black woman from rural North Carolina who comes to the Mayo program at 17. And today at 35, she is the first black woman in the world to create a vaccine. She led the study. She and Bunny Graham at NIH led the study that cr created the technology that created this vaccine. Uh, and you'll see her in Time Magazine last week and in People Magazine this week. But, but I want you to think about our culture. We are not accustomed to thinking of black women creating vaccines. We don't think enough about women in general in doing that. But, and you can only really begin to believe it can happen when you see it. And that's what I want you to think about. I, I close and we can get into questions and answers with a poem, the last three words, the last three lines from Amanda Gorman, Gorman who uh, as just like Maya Angelou did the installation poetry 30 years ago, she did it just recently. And she said this at the end, the new dawn balloons as we free it for there is always light, only if we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Alabama, I challenge you to be the light. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hrabowski. We do have some questions uh, posted in the um, comment section, um, but I want to start with one in particular um, that speaks to something that you mentioned in the book uh, and that has to do with the importance of grit and, and how the narrative about culture change changes over time. Yeah. Can you speak to that? It's a great question. Great question. For years at UMBC, we had been saying it's a place where it's cool to be smart. You know, if you look at public and private institutions, when we think about Carnegie Mellon, we think about brain power. When we think about big universities, we think about sports. And there's nothing wrong, Illinois has great sports, but they also have Nobel laureates. We wanted to be a place, yeah, that was known for brain power first. Um, why am I telling you that? We stopped talking about students being smart because if you talk about, this is about culture change. If you talk about, here are my smart kids, then what are you saying to all the other people who are not in that group? You're telling them, well, you're not the smart kids. And this is why people like Carol, D uh, Carol um, Dweck at Stanford, my friend and Angela Duckworth at Princeton say that, let's stop talking about the smart kids. Let's talk about students who work really hard, grit. Mm -hmm. And we, we started saying this years ago, the Chesapeake Bay Retriever is our dog and mm -hmm. uh, his name is True Grit. And the notion is that we call UMBC the house of grit. It is about hard work and resilience and never giving up. And as we say in church, we fall down, but we get up. And so it's that mindset. And what it means is somebody may not get into the mile program when they come in, but if they work hard and they show that grit, we can pull them over to be an affiliate in that program. So it's the notion that you are today not who you need to be tomorrow. It's not that you were born smart and therefore you are part of the smartest. No, it is what you do. 
It's your mindset. It's the hard work. And that's the part about STEM that we've got to get across to people. It can be very rewarding, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of grit. Thank you. Another, as a follow-up to that, um, there is the, um, a, I guess, a comment about a remark that you made to a group of presidents, college presidents, mm -hmm. that you were discussing leadership. Yes. Can you speak to that in terms of, um, I think we have uh, quite a few leaders uh, among us today and at different levels of the institution from around the state. Sure. And so I think part of the curiosity is how do you sustain leadership around these particular issues? Because it is challenging work and I would even add, it is hard work. It's very hard work. I, I said to presidents, I said this in the book, um, I was invited to, to speak with two or three other presidents to a group of a large group of presidents at the White House. And I was a part of a small group that worked with Mr. Obama regularly as college presidents. And in this three or four of us as presidents, one of the presidents had been talking about all the great things he had been doing and how, how the institution had been changed dramatically. And I, I said, and he's my friend, and I'm glad he's done that. But I said, I've been president now 20 some years. And the one thing I can tell you after all those years is changing the culture of a university is as hard as hell. And the audience went wild with applause. They read all these presidents. You would have thought it was a basketball game because they understood what I was saying. It's where you make two steps forward and then you get pushed back one step. Because if, if things are working for people in power, why would they want to change? Whoever those people are. We are people in power now. You get to a certain age. Uh, but for younger people, for women in a male-dominated world or in a white-dominated world, the idea of structural racism is real. It is real. That's not a bad word. It is a fact that we know there are many ways in which whites have had certain advantages, not all whites. But the fact is that white males particularly are privileged have. And why do I say that? I always tease people and say, I don't say it as an angry black man. I'm a mathematician. I say it as somebody who's a thinker. And what am I saying? I'm saying the language we use can be used to pull people in, not, not be off-putting. But at the same time, we have to admit that to be empowered, really does mean to be vulnerable enough to say, we've got a lot of work to do. And it's not about what they need to do on the outside of society, on our campuses. The, the American professoriate, higher education professoriate is still 75% white. If you look at the most recent issue of the case study, there's a report that just came out yesterday from the Chronicle of Higher Education. I advise you to get it on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it makes this point, seven some percent of the faculty is still white. And we tend to keep picking people like ourselves. And people say, oh, we can't find them. No, we can find them. We can produce them. We can groom them. We can bring them along if we're really committed to it. The military does that. The military is far more enlightened. I like saying this to upset people, the military and we work with, closely with the intelligence community. They are more enlightened than most universities. Just because they have known the importance of bringing in more people. So leadership really does mean being willing to tell the truth, but we, being vulnerable enough to say, but I can't do it by myself. It's mm -hmm. shared leadership. It's shared leadership, whether I'm a dean or president or chair or a faculty member, how do I get others to come along with me in this? And that's what's happened on our campus. It has been the faculty Committed staff, but faculty in certain groups who said we could be better than this. Whether well, talking about bringing in more women to the faculty or talking about, and some guys, look at our STRIDE program, S T R I D E. It's modeled heavily after some things that happened at the University of Michigan, in fact, but it is to increase the numbers of faculty of color and it intersects with our advanced program because we bring in more women of color, uh, but both are designed to diversify the faculty. Great. Thank you. There is a question that's kind of asking us to shift gears for a second. Um, as a postdoc, we have been committed to the academic path since undergrad, but as you say, faculty are important. One, in your opinion, why do Black postdocs not want to continue to become faculty? It's a two-part question. And then two, based on the previous answer, what initiatives should be put in place to retain postdocs to continue to become faculty? Great questions, very good question. And it is true. And we saw that even with my program as my house, we've had a thousand graduate now, hundreds and hundreds who've gone on to grad school, I mean, 80 some percent. And the fact is that even when they get PhDs and postdocs, they are in, in many cases, not encouraged to go on and get that faculty position or they've had such a tough time that they don't wanna be in the environment. And, and this, is a, this is about the high expectations I talked about in my TED talk 
Fact is that the question we need to be asking our graduate students and postdocs is, uh, and women and people of color and blacks, and we have to specify, it's not enough just to say people of color. You gotta, you gotta look at every group and what they're going through. My international postdocs have a different experience on my blacks who may have grown up in New York or wherever, for example. And the fact is you have to be specific, specific about a department, about the advisor. And the question is, what is the experience? And one of the real challenges if we're to be truthful is that postdocs like grad students feel that their heads are in the lion's mouth. They've got to be careful in what they say and how they react because they know their future relies on the goodwill of that faculty member who's working with them. And even sometimes when people are well-intentioned, they can be very insulting without even realizing it. Mm -hmm. um, very insulting. I invited a group of my scientists years ago um, to walk to go with me to an HBCU that had very few whites. And I had them spend the day there. That was in Maryland. Um, I had worked at Coppin State in the inner city of Baltimore. And at the end of that day, these very distinguished professors in their late 50s and 60s came back with all with goodwill and said, I get it. Because I because they had said, what's the big deal? I mean, we're nice to everybody. Why, is, why are these blacks complaining? that they're not having a good experience. They came back and the first thing they realized was how strangely they felt being the only one in the room and how people said things that they meant well by, but were just very off-putting, even when people were trying to be nice to them. And they began to see that these cultural differences are real. Now, on the one hand, I'm from what we have learned, we're teaching our students more and more about having tough skin because the best thinkers have tough skin and they want honest feedback about one's present presentation skills, one's writing skills, one's thinking skills, um, one's get up and go, all those things. We want feedback, it's very important. But the other part is, uh, is a structural problem in that the question is, is the in environment one that nurtures and supports students in moving to the professoriate? I have said to NIH, to the national agencies, um, uh, I would say uh, to NSF, any of the national agencies, that we need more attention placed on the experiences of budding scientists of color, just as we have with the, I love the advanced program and I, I wanna keep pushing that. We need to put more money into it to get more women, but we don't do, I, our National Academy study said we needed the program for blacks and Latinos, particularly Native Americans that was comparable to the advanced program. This country has not made a commitment to race to do that at this point. We need both and we need the intersection of the two. And so to those black doctoral students, I would say number one, um, don't let anyone else define who you are. I remember in grad school, people, whether they meant to or not, working to make me feel ordinary. I've been the only kid in the class. Uh, and I really had to go back to what I had been told by some of my Hampton professors and to one or two people in Illinois who said, no, you're extraordinary. Don't you allow, allow them to make you feel ordinary, number one. Number two, though, you're going to have to think about do you, you, what you're asking is, do I really want to be in this environment in the professoriate where it looks like it's just not one that, that is elevating or uplifting to me? I want to encourage postdocs to stay in science. We need more postdocs to stay in science and to do bench science. We need to have many more in the national agencies and many more in all types of institutions from HBCUs to research universities and others. Uh, and and it, can be, uh, it can be painful at first, it really can, just in, in many ways, and yet the reward is great. The reward is really great. We need, but we need programs to answer that second question that allow postdocs to see how they can make a difference and what it means to move to the faculty. So our postdoc program brings in people and gives them three years to support their research and to see what it means to be a faculty member, to see what the chemistry is with that department. And we've been slowly moving more of those postdocs into the departments. Are we where we need to be? Absolutely not. We talk about a presence in my STEM areas, meaning one or two, we finally got into that, of blacks, and then three or four maybe of Latinos. So no, we, I don't speak from a pedestal here. We are still working on these issues, but we have support from the provost and the deans and leading faculty who are saying we must bring more people of color in just as we wanna to continue to bring in more women. But stay strong to the postdoc, stay strong. So there's another departure uh, that aligns really probably more with the book related to um, your discussion around culture change. And it's kind of long, but I'm gonna read it because it was uh, posted um, to me 
directly, but I'm going to see if I can sort of, sort of deconstruct some okay. of it. And this was a comment that was made by a Canadian a scholar in regards to her observation about universities in the US. I wish the universities understood the promise of growth and self-discovery, learning how to connect with other people, find out who you are, how to build relationships, how to challenge systems, all of these things that anyone who loves academia holds up. If you're not encouraging that for students of color and for women, you're failing your students and there's nothing in the degree of value that will outweigh that because all you're doing is teaching them how to be used by a system instead of how to shake systems and shake the world. Hmm. Do you have any thoughts or reaction yeah. to that? It's a powerful statement. I, my first thought was about the Tocqueville and his observations. I'm studying French culture, j'étudie la France, the, the culture française. Uh, every day, avec mes étudiants. Um, and I started taking French at Ullman High School, by the way, <laughs> but I'm really studying French now every day. Um, and the, the Tocqueville's points about American strengths, but then challenging us in years ago in, in the 19th century, when thinking about what we do well and what we don't do well. And uh, for some students, that, that observer is profound in that for some students, uh, it, the experience is exactly what they need and they move on and they do really well. I will tell you, having worked with hundreds of kids who've gone on to get, I mean, more than hundreds of kids who've gone on to get PhDs and some with the faculty and others, my wonderful white male students always seem to find the right person who's like them and they get the relationship building and they get the aspirations and now they're on the faculties around the country. Mm -hmm. um, for some women, it's that way. For other women, it is not that way. And for Blacks and Latinos, it only happens when there's somebody who does exactly what he is suggesting, that you really are proactive about helping that student of color. Mm -hmm. And for women also, I would say the same thing. Mike Summers, if you look him up, is uh, an amazing scientist, biochemist on my campus, member of the National Academies of Sciences, Howard Hughes. He was on the cover of my last book, Holding Fast to Dreams, but he is known for nurturing and developing relationships with Blacks and Latinos and women and sending them on, not only to grad school, but some in his own lab and postdocs, and now they're on the faculties from Harvard to Case Western. And But it's the relationships. It is that idea. And he has taught them how to be leaders and to pull others into the work. Right. And so when he goes to give a talk, he will only go if people want him to give a talk on his work on AIDS um, and his work on HIV and his work in diversity. That's how much of a commitment he made. He only goes when they want to hear what he's doing to increase the number of women and Blacks and Latinos who succeed. And he shows you pictures of all of his graduates and photos of his, of his lab and shows that diversity there and how they talk about those things, including yeah, race and gender, but religion and LGBTQ, all these different areas of diversity that we should all be talking about. But the, the, the observer, I love the observer's point because it will either elevate people or upset people. Either way, it's towards education. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I, so when people get upset about my TED talk, I'm saying, well, if it gets them to think, we need people to think about why is it that we've not really been moving the needle? Mm. Why is it that we still have so few women at the full professor level? I know it's taking time, but I, what's it going to take? But then for Blacks, in so many departments, there's nobody. There's mm. nobody. And for Latinx, very small. And it will take exactly what he's saying, creating a culture that spends more time, and we did that with the advanced program, to look at the culture of mentoring. What we found was that in those departments, and we started with STEM, but we brought all the chairs in, in those departments where mentoring was strong, and somebody was mentoring every junior faculty member, junior faculty members were much more successful. Mm -hmm. In departments that thought, or when people thought mentoring was more loosey-goosey, warm, not, nothing that really was rigorous, people didn't do as well. And the result was people came and they did not get tenure. And that's all that investment from the, even from the fiscal side. You put all that investment into somebody, never mind the fact that you're really hurting that person's career, but it's such a poor fiscal decision not to give strong mentoring to women and people of color. That's what I would say. And then finally, but son, mentoring being a champion, that's the final step that, that people, most people will tell you um, they had somebody who was a champion for them in their career. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really important. And quite frankly, the privilege of white is that people find people like themselves and they're off and running. And that's a wonderful thing. We just need the same thing for other groups. One of, one of the, and that, I think that's a good segue into this next question. Um, 
And it's really the profoundness of the idea that you share that success is never final. Yes. Um, I've heard you talk very eloquently about your own trajectory um, into higher education mm -hmm. and the support that you got along the way from mentors and teachers and others in your during your life experience. So could you talk a little bit about what led you to that conclusion and how um, you've um, used that to sustain the work that you do? Sure. I, I often talk about having two experiences in high school. My parents sent me to New England uh, one summer to to see what it would be like to be in class with white children because they really were worried about my physical safety if I had been one of those kids who integrated, seeing how rocks were thrown at people and though it was not a pretty situation. Uh, and um, that taught me two things, right? That yes, as a black child, I could be in a, a white class in Massachusetts, in Springfield, Massachusetts, but kids still didn't speak to me and the teacher wouldn't call on me. While I thought the North was all so much better, no, it was not. No, I could be tolerated, but no, they would not. So I really understood what Ralph Ellison meant by the invisible man. And that was one of the reasons when I did well. And, and, but, but it gave me rich education. The education was much stronger than anything I'd ever seen in chemistry and in mathematics and the word problems, wonderful, and literature. Um, and so I was able to do really well on tests and could have gone to one of the New England institutions but, and I went at age 15 from all when I graduated, but my parents didn't trust those institutions because they were worried that nobody would really take care of me and nurture me and support me. And they wanted me to go to Morehouse. And, but I went to Hampton, my beloved Hampton, which was considered way up north. They weren't happy about that. But I tell you, and I had black and white faculty who were wonderful. And then I went to Illinois and the Hamptonians had really prepared me for that cold environment uh, where it was all white men in the class you know, and, and professors, and often a French professor in mathematics in um, topology was far nicer to me than the typical white American professor. That was just the reality of it. It's very interesting. Why do I, and I've gone back and I'm very involved with the University of Illinois, but I'm saying to you that I saw these experiences. The one experience that was so fascinating though, was a summer, an NSF program for, for kids in the summer at Tuskegee University. And the professor comes in and these are all really smart kids, as we call them then, smart kids, high achievers. And they're mainly from the North. And they're more sophisticated than the Southern kids. They've had stronger backgrounds and were a little condescending towards us Southern kids. And the professor puts a problem on the board and, and, he, and nobody could solve it. And they all, we were all cocky thinking we were that good. And he said, when somebody can solve it, come and see me in my office. And he walked out and everybody was really upset, very upset, because how dare he? If he's a good teacher, he's going to show us how to solve this problem. They were all 16, I was 13. So I was not as cynical as the teenagers. And I said, well, no, it just means he believes in us a lot, right? We spent two or three days working on this math problem. We finally got it, but it was, and when he left, I said, who is that guy? And they said, his name is doctor. And they called his name. And I said, he's not a physician. They said, no, he's a PhD. And I said, what's a PhD? They said, that's the highest degree you can get in these disciplines. I said, that's what I'm gonna get. So every day from that day on, every morning I'd wake up and I'd look at myself and say, good morning, Dr. Rybowski. The idea of being knowledgeable and so knowledgeable that you can challenge students to think more critically than they ever thought they could. That was my entree into higher education. He was a dean and a professor and I just thought it was amazing. And that got me, so being able to see people like yourself really does say, maybe I can do that too. You're on mute, you're on mute. Um, there was some background noise, the, the, the gardener up there. Uh -huh. um, how have you focused on mental health impacts of the COVID-19 on women STEM faculty, postdocs and your graduate students? Has that been a focus on your campus? And this is sort of a, um, a, a question that's come from one of our participants. Yes, uh, we, we are very strong in shared governance. Um, the leaders of our faculty senate, uh, the, the chair and the head of the academic planning and budgeting sit on the president's council with me, uh, with our leaders. And we have conversations about all topics. And one of the big challenges was involving particularly young faculty and women faculty and the challenges of dealing with family and remote learning and what that meant. And so we have developed support circles, groups, to give people opportunities, not only to talk about the issues, but to even talk about resources and tele, telehealth and a lot of support for a number of people and ways of 
even giving people in different units, staff and faculty, ways of knowing how to get colleagues to the right expertise, to the right resource when they're having challenges. And so we've spent quite a bit of time focused on, and town meetings and focus groups, the same things we do in, in general. We, we believe strongly in listening to the voices mm. of colleagues. The advanced program does a good job of that, of giving women a chance to say, and of building cohorts of women. The best news I can tell you about our advanced program is that, and I talk about this in the book, in that it was so frustrating because some of these young women moved on to leadership positions on my campus, and now they've moved on. Mm. Uh, the dean of Virginia Tech at, in engineering is one of my former deans. And I can just name a number of dean up in Massachusetts right now and one in Maine and other places. Uh, and, and, and what it taught me was that um, we want to prepare women for the leadership positions, both within the professoriate rank, but also for administrative jobs. But it also means you're not going to have so many on your campus. Now, how is that related to the first part of the question? Listening to the voices of women who said to me, Freeman, you shouldn't feel bad when somebody gets this great opportunity because they can take your philosophy all to another institution. The same thing when they said, listen, older colleagues on campus don't have little children at home. Mm -hmm. So they don't know what we're going through. They don't understand how challenging it is to deal with this, especially when we were letting people come back to do some research, but they also have some teaching responsibility and the kids are at home during the school. And so having a chance to listen to those concerns and to find small ways of giving people support has been very encouraging to my campus. And we get a lot of people saying, thanks for just listening. I appreciate it. This is what I can do. These are the resources I can have. It's very important, very important. As a, as a follow-up to that, Dr. Habrowski, um, have you had any conversations among your, your Senate and with um, department heads or deans regarding tenure and promotion? and um, making some, um, oh, yeah. I guess, considerations in terms of that going forward. Guiding principle for faculty and students is this must be a time for great flexibility, mm. for compassion, flexibility, um, thinking through what's best for the person, for that faculty member, for that student. Uh, I, you know, this, this may sound counterintuitive, but this should be a period when all of us think about what the Canadian researchers said about building relationships and creating a climate that mm -hmm. has people knowing how you shake things up in order to make them better for more people. This should be that period on many levels in our universities and in society. Right now, my wife and I have been participating uh, in the COVID trial. We, uh, and we've been doing commercials for the governor. The governor got a number of leaders of color and women to uh, do these commercials for our state called Go Backs. And uh, ours, focus on the fact that we had been hearing about these, the study with Moderna from my graduate, Dr. Kismikia Corbett. And she was saying the problem was that too few blacks in particular were willing to be in the study. And of course, everybody makes up the Tuskegee study. We know the grotesque pictures from there, but also Hopkins and the Henrietta Lack study. And so there is not as much trust from people of color about medicine and science. Mm -hmm. And we have an underrepresentation in medicine today. And so we need more people, but but to hear this scientist who created that technology, who created the vaccine saying, we've got to get more people to be in the study so that we can show that it's effective, that the vaccine is effective for that group was inspiring to us. And so we did do it and we went through, you know, you have half placebo, half actually get the vaccine. It was months later, only about six weeks ago that we had the unblinding visit to see if you got the real deal. We had gotten the real deal. We had the symptoms that we thought we would have and, and we can talk about it. Now, why am I saying that? It seems to me that right now, places like UAB, UMBC, those with science all around, and University of Huntsville, and a and and over all the educated faculty within science are the ambassadors, can be the ambassadors to talk about what science does for our society. And it's very important. And this is why having more people represented, more women and people of color in talking about this is very, very important because people, Women want to see more women involved at the top. Blacks and Latinos, the same thing. Mm -hmm. Because that says, okay, we're all in this together. Very important. Great. I'm going to give you a chance to take a sip of water, if you like, while I Thank focus you. on this next question here. That was very humane of you. Dr. Absolutely. <laughs> I know I could use one right about now. 
So this next question, well, before we before I ask this question, one of our uh, participants wanted to know the name of the scientist who worked on the vaccine. I think you just mentioned her again, Sunithia Corbett. Uh, um, it, it's um, Kizmekia, K-I-Z-Z-M-E-K-I-A is the first name. She grew up in Hillsborough, North Carolina. Corbett, C-O-R-B-E-T-T. -T. There's some great interviews. Dr. Fauci nominated her to be one of the, these top next 100 uh, in the in the world in Time mm -hmm. Magazine last week. He writes it and he says, if you want to know, he says, tell my African-American brothers and sisters, an African-American woman created this vaccine. Yes. These are the words of Dr. Val Fauci. It's Thank a wonderful you. story. Really. Who, by the way, is going to be the commencement speaker at one of my alma maters this year. Sure. Very Dr. Nice. Fauci, yes. Yeah, he's a good guy, good guy. Right. Yeah. But this next question here is from one of our participants and they are asking when Black Indigenous people of color students are at PWIs, how would you advise them to deal with or bypass academic politics? And if, if faculty members, this is why the advanced program talks about the idea of building community. Mm. Uh, the Mauer program does the same thing. We have other programs on campus. Building community means finding people who can give you advice about the unspoken words. Mm -hmm. Because you've got some things, the, her question is very important, whether it's indigenous people, Latinx, black, whatever the group, the mainstream culture has not usually thought through how to pull people who are different, who are underrepresented into that mainstream culture in a way that they feel supported and encouraged to, to go to the top. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not even deliberate, it's just that people haven't thought it through and they don't understand how the culture comes across to people. But it does take having a community of people, whether they're three people or 10, who are a cohort, who can talk about their experiences, who can ask each other questions, who can look to people who've been there longer, whether they are of color or not, who can say, this is what you're experiencing right now. This is what you're gonna need to do. This is what it takes to get to the next level. Uh, for our campus, the advanced program was wonderful in helping us think about our tenure goals because in some departments, uh, the expectations, it was more like pornography at one point, you will know it when we see it. You know, I mean, you know, you will know, you know, and, and, and fortunately the advanced group of women, this was 10, 12, 14 years ago, um, helped us with the faculty senate and then with departments to say, no, we need clearer expectations mm -hmm. for junior faculty. Mm -hmm. so that they can know how they're moving along the path. So they get the level of specificity. So it's not a matter of, no, we'll know it when we see it, but no, this is what I needed to do. And, and these are the, the processes in place for giving me feedback with specificity to make sure I am succeeding. It's very important. And just one point for women and people of color that we've had to work on, what happens in so many cases when there are so few women or people of color students of color will come wanting support. Mm -hmm. And if we're not careful, the students can get the help, but the faculty member doesn't get the research done. Right. And while everybody will say, oh, this person is wonderful, then it's time for tenure and people say, we're so sorry. Mm -hmm. So we have had workshops for people of color and for women to talk about uh, how you say no, mm -hmm. how you have the right person in power helping you to balance what you're doing, the teaching, the research, the service, whether it's outreach or whatever. I, and what I've had to say to students, the faculty of color, the same thing I say to students of color, you can't do but so much because mm -hmm. right now you've got to get stability. Mm -hmm. You can do much more at the university to help many more students if you get tenure. Right. But if you don't get tenure, you are beloved by students and you're no longer there. Mm -hmm. I've seen this all over the country for women and for people of color. And it, it's a critical factor in thinking about how we make sure we retain people we recruit. Thank you. Uh, and there's a follow-up um, that's kind of related to the tenure piece of some of the comments you just made, but can you share your thoughts on the growing notion of phasing out tenure, especially in light of the challenges that some women, and I would even add that uh, by black indigenous people of color face in moving up in the academy. Let me say I've been in the academy now 40 years, more than 40 years. Uh, I've been a dean for 45 years, but I mean, 45 years ago. 
tenure will not be phased out in my lifetime. Now I don't have a terminal more years to live, but let me just say, <laughs> but no, I, I think it's I think it would be naive if anybody thinks anytime soon that tenure is going to be phased out. Now, what can happen and what we've been working to do is to see how do we bring these other factors into the work? Research is important, obviously, but quality of teaching. How do we think about building our, our emphasis on service to the community, service to our campus, and these issues of diversity? I do think, I do foresee more attention being given to ways of giving people incentive, of incentivizing people to do more, to bring more people from underrepresented groups, women and others into the work and giving them support. The mentoring, all of that is where we need to go. I just, and it, perhaps I'm short-sighted, but no, you heard me say changing the culture of the, of the academy is very hard. Mm -hmm. I use those other dramatic words on purpose, it's hard as hell, it just is. Mm -hmm. um, why would people in power give up that power? That's not gonna happen, I don't think. And I'm not being cynical, I just don't see it. I do think we will be able to broaden the definition. I do see campuses that are really giving more attention to the importance of teaching, for example, or the importance of service, of diversity and bringing those people into it. We, we have a number of ways that we do that on our campus, including photos all over the campus showing faculty, white men sometimes, in addition to women, and young people of color in labs working ways of, and then we have research awards uh, that we give that emphasize teaching and mentoring, and then teaching and mentoring awards that look at diversity and research. And we make a big deal out of those kinds of things to give as many incentives as we can. But that is my honest opinion. I would be, I would not be being authentic if I said anything else. Great. So um, as you made those comments, um, it struck me that um, your campus is, um, I guess, pretty diverse. Um, UAB is a PWI, uh, and then we have partners with some of the HBCUs, but being in the South and really all over the country, Dr. Nabrowski, we've had a number of incidents um, since the George Floyd um, killing that have led to uh, campus unrest mm -hmm. and um, students have um, voiced their opinions and even demonstrated and offered um, their ideas in terms of how the changes that they think universities need to make yes. in order to be more welcoming of places where students, all students feel they have a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. um, have you had experiences such as that on your campus and how have oh, you addressed goodness. some of those oh, issues? Yeah. You, you don't stay, you're not a president for 30 years without having all kinds of protests all yes. the time, no. And the first thing I always say, and in fact, even when I was vice provost there, we had a big black student protest back in 1989. And uh, they took over the administration building for uh, a whole week and TV cameras and all. And we had problems we needed to deal with. Um, in two years ago, we had a major protest involving Title IX that was not led though by the women leader students or the Center for Women, but by others who didn't know all the things that were going on. And because people wanted me to fire a, a person and I wasn't willing to fire that person without giving that person a chance to prove innocence. Mm -hmm. uh, I tell you that because now, as a result of the last protests involving Title IX, we are stronger than ever. The, the courts ended up saying we had done nothing wrong, uh, but they said we were complying. But what we learned was that compliance is not enough. Mm -hmm. You can be in compliance with the law, but young women students and some young men students who have been harassed need more support than that. And so we ended up investing much more money. If you look at our Office of Equity and Inclusion now, it is very strong. We put a lot of money into it with a number of attorneys and others and counselors to support our students, women and people, men who might be harassed, but also that focuses on racial problems and challenges and ways of bringing people together. So we've got that large staff and then we have a very prestigious OENI Council, Office of Equity and Inclusion Council with some of the strongest faculty in addition to staff, in addition to students there to deal with some of these issues. And it has, this last year, even during COVID, we've had all kinds of challenges, uh, but those complaints and concerns have been managed and handled with both compassion and effectiveness. So no, no, we've, we've gone through it. We, we talk about retriever courage. Yes, um, we do have partnerships, by the way, with some of the HBCUs. We've worked with Howard in a number of ways. The provost at Howard is a UMBC graduate. Howard has replicated the Myhoff program and the person who is over there, Bison Scholars Program, is uh, a UMBC graduate. So we are having a, a stake with some of the HBCUs. And most important, we've worked with UMES, for example, in our state, in the another NSF program 
with some of the campuses um, involved in that one system from the medical school downtown to the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. But no, protests, I would say to anybody, are, can be a healthy part of democracy. They, they can make us better. The protest that we had 30 years ago led to our thinking through what else can we do because so many black students were flunking out in science, mm -hmm. frankly. So no, often protests from the beginning of this country, those protests in different ways have made us a stronger society. They need to be, they need to be nonviolent though, I would say that. That's the one thing I would say. So um, having shared that, as the longest sitting president at a public university, what sustained you? You know, I, I assume I'm one of the longest. I haven't thought about that about being the long. You know, my the president of my alma mater, which is private, has been there longer. He's been there 40 years. I'm just 30. But for Publix, you know, I, I I'll have to go and look and see if I'm the longest. I'm one of the longest tenure. I thought he I thought he stepped down. Maybe not. He is, he has, he is he's just that retired. would make you the longest, I think. Well, he well, he but he had more years in before I would leave. But 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 let me <laughs> okay. just say that. But among publics, I'd be one of the longest. And I work with new presidents at Harvard, and average number of years for college presidents is only five or six, mm -hmm. usually. So it is a challenge. And now your question, I got caught up with the question you asked. What was the uh, what, was the what sustains you, Dr. Oh, oh, without a doubt, just the love of students, students, students and ideas. Mm -hmm. It's only in the academy that we can learn new ideas every day. This is why I'm studying French culture and language, uh, uh, not only for what happens in France and Paris, but what happens in the African diaspora, the French culture. I mean, the idea of studying ideas is what sustains me. The fascination of creating a program that will have one young man becoming the leading neuroscientist, young investigator in the world. The Neuroscience Society gave its award to Dr. Kafri Zarasa two years ago. He's at Duke, he's an endowed chair at Duke, a Meyerhoff scholar someone I mentioned before who has created a pacemaker for the brain to address schizophrenia. I mean, just imagine a 17 year old who gets inspired. The idea of the two young women on your campus coming to us at 17 and they were just talented in science and now being uh, faculty there in adolescent medicine. So other little girls and kids can see them and say, wow, I wanna be like them. What could be more fascinating than seeing young people achieve their dreams and create new ideas and broaden our minds beyond what we thought possible. Mm -hmm. That's what excites me. Great, thank you. We have a few more minutes, Doctor. Um, there's one last question here, let me take a look. Um, there's a lot of the comments are people thanking you for all of the uh, positive comments and for the enlightenment. Um, certainly that's one, um, Post says, thank you for your positive approach to leadership that enlightens us all and motivates us all to do better. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's kind of a, um, a point uh, for a question that resonates with me a lot because it came up yesterday. We had a workshop yesterday and the question came up yesterday that was kind of a challenge to respond to. And that was the resistance that you encounter as you move about um, trying to do better and be better um, how do you address that? Or what are some of the strategies that you've used to ad address resistance? It's just, it's a, it's such a great question. It goes to that question of how hard it is to bring about culture change. As prestigious as the Maha program is now, uh, again, we, we are number one in producing Blacks who get MD, PhDs, number two in producing Blacks who get STEM degrees, only behind Howard. Howard has about 10,000 Blacks. We have 2,000 Blacks of our 14. Uh, but here's what I would say to you. Um, in the first years, some of my finest faculty were not happy with the idea of a program for Blacks. Mm. They thought it was un-American. And, and yet I said, show me Blacks who are, who are graduating with a B average. And they could not. And their first thought was, it's going to take more generations. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, we are scientists. And so we must experiment with different ways of seeing how we can help this group. We've been around all these years and we, we don't see Blacks I mean, Blacks then were going to med school, they had a 2-9 because it was so unusual to have whites coming out of Black schools. With, I mean, Blacks coming out of white schools with a 2-9, they could get into med school, it was amazing. Um, and quite frankly, the notion of experimenting, the reason we're in the top 10, according to the US News in innovation is that we're always experimenting, and trying different approaches to increasing the level of success and, 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 and challenging scientists to not simply conclude what can and cannot do based on what they have or have not seen, mm. but to be willing to 
try the experimental approach. And that's what we did with Meyerhoff. It has been an experiment. Can we bring in kids of color, students of color, and now other students, have them work together and have them dream about becoming scientists and research physicians, for example, and what will that take? And we learned along the way so that some of those who wrote me long letters in the first saying, this is not American, and they meant no harm, they just hadn't seen it, became some of the biggest supporters. Mm -hmm. They would come on the weekends to help recruit the students. They got these students into their labs. And as they had more black kids in their labs and Latino and other groups, Native Americans, they began to see it's prestige. Any lab that's really fabulous is doing great science, but they're thinking about the challenge of humankind. It's what Du Bois said, the color line. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got to pull more of these students of color into our labs. The two things that I want people to think about from the HBCUs to others, because we all have this problem that read out courses, as most students don't make it in science, wherever you are, that is a challenge. Uh, the fact is, we've got to figure out ways of having programs that will ensure that students get at least a B. If students can get a B in the first two years of the work, build that confidence and start having hands-on research experiences, that student is on her way. It takes that first two years. And, and what we had to learn that was a culture change. We were accustomed to kids getting C's and continuing on. Well, you get a C in the first year of chemistry, it's hard to move on and get a B in the next year of chemistry. It just is. So at first we started having students repeat courses. Some of those who repeated those courses went on and became PhDs and MD PhDs from University of Pennsylvania all the way up to Harvard. But then the faculty said, we don't want people to have to repeat so many courses. How might we change the course? And so the idea of redesigning the course and professional development to give faculty the chance to think about how else it might be taught in a way that looks at not only the teaching, but the assessment, the use of technology, the use of collaboration, the active learning uh, in that CDC, in our Chemistry Discovery Center, you really do see everybody, when you walk in, it's like noise. Mm -hmm. Everybody's quiet. You've got a provocateur, you've got the facilitator, you've got the technologist, all and you see it and you look at the videos of that and you get a feel for that. And then finally, the people didn't like the idea of uh, building community because they said you're making robots. No. People work in teams, mm -hmm. people work in teams and we need to teach them. So look at the 60 minutes piece on the mile program. And you wanna know culture change? Americans were upset when they heard on the 60 minutes piece, we take the phones away from the pre-freshmen in the bridge program. They don't have their phones during the week. I got hate mail from Americans saying, this is not American to take somebody's phone away. But you know who recommended that we take the phones away? The students at the end of one of the bridge programs, they said, if you want us to get to know each other better and to learn to trust each other and connect, take our phones away during the week so we're not talking with our best friends from high school. And it was the best thing we could have done because they all suffered together. Because I mean, think about it, anybody on this call, somebody takes your phone away for a week, you're depressed. You know, you have to lean on other kinds of things. But it was culture change. And it's now a part of that program. So the idea of resistance means getting people calmly to consider trying something, that's all. Let's just try it and see if it works. That has worked. Great, great, great suggestion. Thank you. So one of your former students did post comments. She said, thank you, Dr. Obrowski, for inspiring me for so many years. Hope to see you in person soon. Dr. Stephanie Wallace, MD, UAB Pediatrics. <laughs> she was watching. I have to tell just a quick story. Stephanie was the best student in organic chemistry. She was so good that she had figured out a way to solve some problems in organic chemistry that the students, in, and then we had a chance to look at people's tests. We were looking at the test. They called it the Borkins method. Mm. I'm sorry. Everybody wanted to learn the Borkins method. So here was this young woman at 18 or 19 creating the Borkins method for solving and understanding these problems in organic chemistry. We knew she was going to go on and she did go on to Yale. And then, um, and, and, and Birmingham is very fortunate to have her in Nefertiti. They're, they are the best ever. <laughs> Thank you. So we have about uh, five minutes left and I want to give you an opportunity to share any closing thoughts that you have with the group. And um, then we will give uh, some information about uh, the book. We do have the book available at the university bookstore and we have a, um, a queue that uh, people can um, grab with their, their cell phone that they'd like. But do you have closing thoughts, Dr. Browse? Sure, sure, sure. You know, the, the, the purpose of the Empowered University 
as we were writing it was to listen to the voices on our campus of women, of people of color, of, of male colleagues about what are we doing well? What have we achieved over the past 20, 25 years? And where do we need to go from here? And I will tell you, I learned more than anyone because some things I thought had happened for certain reasons didn't happen for those reasons. I had faculty saying, Freeman, uh, yeah, the university supported me, but there are people who don't get along here. And you have to work around the relationships of administrators and staff members sometimes and the bureaucracy to get something done more than you realize. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and as they were talking, I just had to be humbled and listen to it and to say, we can be better than this. So the book helps campuses think about itself, uh, the, themselves. And most important, the work that we're doing is saying, we're not saying we are the idea, we're saying we're on the path. It's a journey, it's a journey. And that's what I want people to think about, that any campus that's really making progress is trying new approaches, is looking at best practices. I would think Alabama should be, as a state, whether you're HBCUs, Huntsville, Auburn, U University of Alabama, Birmingham, needs to be looking at something like the Milehoff program. You really do because you're not in the list of people producing the black kids. And when thinking about the, the advanced program, we learned from the faculty and the students. Advanced was based on our Mahoff model of, mm -hmm. of the expectations I talked about in the TED talk, of building community, of getting the researchers to help researchers. That's true for faculty and support as it is for students. I would encourage people to strongly suggest to your leadership that the leadership must listen to the voices of these underrepresented populations. Asking good questions, listening carefully and acting based on that common wisdom that develops from building this sense of trust. It's, it's very important. And it's been more important to us now in COVID than ever before. It, my last comment that I say to everybody, keep hope alive. It's a challenging time. Attitude matters, mindset, keep hope alive and come visit me at UMBC at some point. Thank you so much, Dr. Habrowski. And as I said in the introduction for you now, we've given you a new title, Brother Habrowski. <laughs> Thank you for sitting among us today. We really appreciate you for spending time with us. And from the comments that were made by participants, um, I think you're, that it's safe to say that um, everyone enjoyed listening to you today. So we will, we will follow up at some point um, to learn more about your program. Thank you. Just know I am a proud son of Alabama and of Birmingham, coming out of the roots of Wetumpka and Selma. I'm proud of all of that. I really am. <laughs> Thank you again. And for those of you who are still with us, um, as I mentioned, there are autographed copies of the book available in the university bookstore. So feel free to reach out to grab yourself a copy of the book. Um, I, don't, I don't think you'll be disappointed in reading that. And I'd also like to thank uh, my team, Holly Holiday Jones, Ashley Aldrich and Bria Morgan for their support of this um, program today. They are always available and doing the things to make things go well. So we appreciate you. And to our participants, thank you for hanging in there with us. We appreciate all that you're doing to support the advanced initiative here at UAB. And as I mentioned, we have two additional programs coming. April 22nd is our final workshop with the advanced program. And then Picture a Scientist, which is a partnership with the Commission on the Status of Women, um, that is a film screening that starts on March 8th. So we look forward to having you join us for those events. Thank you all again and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Goodbye, Dr. Hrabowski. Bye-bye. Keep hope alive. We will take care. Bye.